Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Dennis Brown, otherwise known as VK6FADF, uh, Foundation Licence uh, Amateur. And uh, I've been licensed since um, March-ish last year. Um, one of these days, when time and time and time permits, uh, I'm hoping to upgrade to um, a standard and or uh, advanced call. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Lee Thompson, uh, who's been licensed since the 1960 and has been working with magnetic loop antennas uh, over the last 10 years or so. This presentation uh, should be given ideally by um, Alan Hutima, uh, VK6 MST. Uh, Alan is currently enjoying the climbs of Sydney um, on his boat, uh, half his luck. Um, because uh, Alan um, and accidentally myself got involved with um, uh, experimentation with magnetic loop antennas and on my side of things, um, uh, wisely or not, I contributed the notion of using an Arduino uh, device to control the tuning of the magnetic loop. So I think at this stage of the game, since the bulk of the presentation will be focused on the mag loop and there's not that much uh, smarts involved in the Arduino side, I'd like to hand over to Lee. Perhaps before doing so though, um, how many in the audience are uh, licensed amateurs? Probably quite a few. Yeah, okay, that's great. How many have been using magnetic loops or? Yes, one, two, three, excellent. Okay, if I can hand over now to Lee, please. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Stand up. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, I've been playing around with magnetic loops for the approximately 10 years, I suppose, and you'd wonder how you could do very much with a square piece of pipe or a round piece of pipe. But um, the, the problem we're facing today is that we don't have any room to put up antennas and uh, anybody that's got a small backyard has a problem. And I've been working on these things that I've got a little uh, demo one here. Lee, can you put your microphone a bit higher? A bit higher? How's that? Is that okay? Okay. I just put this little uh, mag loop together to show you what a magnetic loop is. It's a square piece of, this one is a square piece of half inch copper tube using elbows. At the top we've got, can... Take the controllers down there, or just press the space bar. I'll just go up to the, yep, that'll do. At the top we've got a, a capacitor and at the bottom we've got a matching transformer on this one and that uh, matches it to 50 ohm output. The loop works in such a way that it's a very, the resistance has got to be very low and 0.1 of an ohm is what you sort of would need to strive for to, uh, to, to get a loop to work properly. If you just screw it together with screws or make it out of a bit of coax or something you're introducing big losses. So you need to have a good, good solid design. Um, the capacitor at the top has another, is another place for big losses. And if you don't have a very well designed capacitor, you'll lose half your signal in the, in the capacitor. It ultimately should be made of copper and it should be the plates you use, only the plates, never use the wiper because the, the losses are, are great there. Now, at the bottom, you've got the, a current point. It's current down here. You can grab hold of it down here quite safely. If you come up here and grab hold of it, you're going to find out you've got a problem. Um, at about 10 watts, you've got something like 1,500 volts at the top here. And so you've, you've got to keep away from it. Um, for 100 watts, you need to stay about three metres away. So um, it, when you get a, a little bit higher power, um, then you've got to get further away. I've been playing around with them. I'm still alive, but um, I don't... <laughs> it's, it's all only theory at this stage as to really how far you should be away. Can we just go to the next, next slide? Oh, OK. Right. Yeah. Yep. 
This, this is a, uh, a magnetic loop made of 50 mil uh, copper tube. It's got a vacuum capacitor at the top and it has a tuning range from 3.5 megs through to uh, 18 megs and it will handle 200 watts. On 80 meters you can transmit and most people don't know what sort of antenna you're using. Now the advantage of the mag loop, even although it's considered an inefficient radiator, is that most people can't put up an 80 meter dipole at the full height. So you want to get it up at 150 feet or something to get maximum efficiency for a dipole on 80 meters, whereas this works quite fine sitting on the ground here. <laughs> An actual fact, that's below ground level. That's the main ground level up there. And uh, <laughs> I can work on that little 817 into Albany with five and seven reports on 80 meters. Now that's a very efficient loop. That's a half Faraday shield there forming the loop which is 5% of the total diameter and all the all the joints are all welded and um, this is where it's going to come in handy controlling the loop because if you can't uh, you've got to go outside and adjust it every time and it'd be nice to have it so that it's tucked away somewhere and you can remotely control it. That's where the, the big plus is going to be. Um, the loop itself is directional to a degree. You can uh, rotate it. With this little loop just playing around with it, you can put it on the ground and you've got a five and seven signal and you can lift it up in the air and you've still got a five and seven signal. So in theory, you could just have the two sides attached to a metal roof and, but you've still got your coupling, which you've got to make a, then you'd make a gamma match for it and it'll still work. Um, if it's on the ground, you can bring it over to about 45 degrees and it'll still function quite nicely. The impedance match is one to one, quite easy to achieve one to one. And you don't, <coughs> you don't need to worry about um, TVI because the Q is very high as you know, it's an extremely high Q circuit. You can have it sitting right beside a TV. Don't know about the new digital ones, <laughs> but no problems. And uh, it's a very quiet antenna. This little antenna here, with a bit of jiggery pokery, works from seven megs up to 30 megs, if you just as a receive antenna. And it's really good, very quiet. Um, I had it working this morning, sitting on the floor on 40 metres, listening to the little guys around no noise. So it's something that we should all have a play with. And it doesn't cost very much. You can go to Bunnings and get four pieces of 1.5 metre lengths. If you put the four together and put a capacitor and make up a little matching device at the bottom, you've got an antenna that'll work well on 80 metres and 40 metres and 20 metres. You have to have just under a quarter wavelength on the highest frequency you want to use it on. So if you wanted to use it on 40 metres, this is, you'd make it about uh, uh, 16 feet, be okay. It'll work well. So um, that's basically the, the loop. I can, would you like to have a demo of how it works or yeah. put it on? Huh? It won't work very well in here, I can tell you that. <laughs> very good for portable use, take away with you. You know, if you're travelling somewhere. I'll stick it on here. If you like to just switch that on, just to, we've just got a little signal we can put into it. I think it's on 24, isn't it? It's on 12. Hi. It's on 12. Yeah, that's 24. Yeah. Yeah, hang on. Not for me, you can make it Hear that? 
Now it, hear it working on the ground. Yeah. Yep. I think that's putting out about what is it? Yeah. Fifty microvolts. But you can see the directivity is there a bit. If you go into the horizontal plane, I can't do that without holding onto it really. You've got to go a quarter wavelength above the ground at least then on the band you want to listen to. So. And if you change frequency, you change the capacitance and you're on the other band. So. I think, I think in, in the next 10 years, we won't be able to put up HF antennas. It'll be something of the past. And uh, we're gonna be stuck with something like this. It's not, the, it's not the ultimate, but it's a very good substitute. And uh, if you're in the marine business, a uh, very good antenna to have, even as an emergency antenna. So uh, you could make that tuned to the emergency HF frequencies without any problem. You could actually have it fixed, fixed tuned for, uh, for emergency <coughs> use. Industrially, uh, there's a very big market for the mag loop and in Africa, they're looking at magnetic loops in a big way because they want to put them on top of buildings for security reasons. They don't want to have big wires, but they still don't have the communication facilities that we've got here in Australia. And HF, <coughs> HF is still used widely. So, uh, yeah. This, this loop here is the same as that one. I'll just go to the next one. That's a Japanese designed antenna. I don't want to steal your thunder. Do you want this? <laughs> That's a Japanese designed one. The shape is something that they're playing around with, um, thinking that they might get a bit more horizontal polarization out of it, but in actual fact, it's a donut pattern. So it doesn't really matter about the shape as much as you might think. If he turned it the other way around so it was vertical, he might get a bit more vertical polarization in it. For DX, it might even be better if he'd gone vertical with that. The, little bit of playing around I've done with them. I've got a vertical one and it does appear to work that way. This one here, this is a four foot square with one and a half inch copper tube and it's got a gamma match on it and the capacitor at the top is a copper um, capacitor. Once again, it's just feeding the, it's not using the wiper and That'll handle 200 watts um, on all bands up to, uh, that one goes to 80 megs as well, yeah. And down to 80 meters. So that's, that's very good for weather. This, the one previously to that, to that slide with the, with the gamma match, it's not as good at, uh, at weather protection as the, <coughs> as, as, the, as the other one. Where am I going here? <coughs> yeah, this is on a boat. I, I can't speak, I'll, I can't speak, but I'm sure they work really well. Uh, it's a neat little one on the yacht. Or so. Is that on a yacht? Yes, that's, mm. that's on Alan's, uh, I think it's on Alan's boat. Yeah. Yeah. Alan's first effort, it was, he called it the fast loop because his first call sign was VK6. <laughs> okay. And he used that to talk on to the local repeater yeah. um, as a test. The capacitors are important. The vacuum cap is very good at handling very high, high power, high voltages. The only drawback with the vacuum cap is it's a little bit like having an egg mounted on top of your antenna and you can't have any accidents of any kind otherwise you break the capacitor. I made a big... Uh, I made that loop that you saw back there, the copper one, and I had a um, 3,000 vacuum cap on top of it and transmitted on 160 metres with it. 
and it was so sharp that my audio was compressed. <laughs> but it did actually work and uh, probably had a range of about 100 k's with it. So um, this is really the best method. This is the butterfly capacitor. Where is it? Ah, oh, yeah. The butterfly capacitor, this is a, Dave will tell you more about this, but it's a butterfly capacitor and the advantage of that is that it actually provides a balance to the loop. It's better than the vacuum cap in that the signal doesn't get skewed. So if you can get yourself a butterfly capacitor or make one, that's the way to go. So that capacitor was built by Alan on his CNC, it's actually my capacitor. Yeah, I wasn't going to steal the thunder. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that is a really good way to go. And if you do use a vacuum cap, you have to have a choke on your output into the 50 ohm output to stop it um, be, being unbalanced. So uh, there are lots of, lots of things ab about loops. You think it's just the four pieces of pipe or a round circle and there's not much in it. There's a lot in it, and uh, it's all Ohm's law, <laughs> and it's all about losses. So um, there's an example of of the uh, of a match, 50 ohms at, at one to one, and uh, it's pretty easy to achieve that. It's quite easy. The little transformer on that one there. I use that same transformer on all size loops. It'll work on any loop. But the gamma match, it, once you, if you're making something permanent, the gamma match is probably the best way to go. That's an example. I won't go any further than this. I think I'll let Dave take over from here. But I um, hope you found that a bit interesting anyway. Thank you. Yep, thanks very much, Lee. Um, I think that's provided a good grounding in uh, uh, in the magnetic loop and, um, and some of the bits and pieces that go with it. To give some indication, this is uh, that vacuum variable capacitor there, so you can get an idea of the, the, the physical size of the beast. This one has suffered a slight uh, mishap um, in that the vacuum is no longer present, but we're hoping that some kind folks here at UWA physics department might be able to reinstate it. Um, it's notable that uh, there's some contamination, there's some uh, oxidation already taking place on the um, uh, on some of the elements within. Um, and as I was walking up here from my base at QE2, I was musing at the fact that there's no getter. You know, those of us who know about valves, and that would be everybody here, I would hope, uh, will realise that there's usually a bit of metallisation inside the envelope, which I think is magnesium or something of that nature, which after the valve is evacuated, uh, gets fired so that it will suck out um, the remaining sort of oxygen molecules within... Um, or, sorry? Suck out nitrogen too, I can't remember what the other one is. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, I should remember it because it sort of hails from my era. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, um, it's a nice piece of goods. Um, I think Alan got this one from the Ukraine on eBay, you know, the universal supplier. The butterfly capacitor, as um, uh, Ono has mentioned, this is one that Alan made for, for Ono. Um, it could be made out of copper plate, uh, which um, Lee has mentioned it would be uh, would be better in terms of losses. It is it has two advantages. Uh, first of all, it's um, uh, it's balance from a um, uh, an operational point of view, and also it's a, a lower uh, torque required to to actually turn this little guy, so you can use a, a lighter motor. In addition, perhaps a third advantage is that it doesn't matter how far and how often you go over centre because there is no, uh, no limit. These guys on the other hand, and this is where the um, uh, Arduino controller um, came into play, these of course have a defined limit and if you exceed the limit bad things happen and it's not the sort of thing that you want to replace too frequently. More on the physicality. Uh, this is um, Alan's 
uh, implementation, um, sort of phase one, used to drive that. Uh, behind here we can see a couple of limit switches, just, oops, just ordinary um, single pole uh, limit switches. Uh, the idea being that you drive the stepper motor until you know, one or other of the limits is reached uh, and hopefully it will step no more. And this is the cover for the cover and mounting. Um, these yellow pieces and this piece here have come off um, Alan's son's 3D printer and I expect that as 3D printers become more um, economical, I see a few sort of heads nodding, uh, as 3D printers become more um, uh, economical, I expect that there'll be a few um, of these and similar projects uh, being, being seen around the traps. That was an earlier uh, illustration of, um, of Alan's design. Uh, pre, it predates the, the 3D printing. Um, the yellow uh, and red uh, buttons there can, is a 3D printed cover which conceals a, um, uh, an Arduino shield, an LCD shield. And there are the bits and bobs. Okay, so from the, rather than turn my back to you, uh, the important points as far as the, the control for the mag loop is, antenna is concerned is that you need, to remain, you need to maintain a certain distance from the beast, uh, not only because of the high voltages that can be involved as you start to feed more power into it, but also you get um, capacitive effects from the body, um, so you really want to maintain some distance from it. Alan originally used a geared head DC motor and even went to the extent of using pulse width modulation control but found that principally as a result of the, the high torque that you needed to start, st start moving this beast that um, that was not particularly satisfactory. So um, somehow or other we conceived the idea of using a stepper motor control and um, we then looked around for some means of controlling the beast, um, settled on the Arduino, but of course it could be anything. It could be you know, a, a dedicated microcontroller chip, um, Beagle, um, you name it. The important points is isolation from your um, radio uh, and voltage, high voltage fields, um, limit switches if you're going to use a vacuum variable capacitor, uh, the Arduino and its display are located in your shack and well he's using Cat5 cable but whatever happens to be available to um, provide the link. The stepper motor uh, is in this particular design it's a seven and a half degree 12 volt bipolar. Uh, it's driven from a little H bridge you know uh, L298 type chip you can get these things off of eBay for sub five dollars these days. Uh, limit switches are normally closed uh, the reason be behind that decision was that if any open circuits occurred in the, um, in the circuitry that the limit condition would then be sensed and power would be um, uh, shut down to the, to the stepper, basically just to protect the uh, rather expensive variable capacitor. And um, the 3D uh, printed um, implementation for the base and so forth. In the shack, um, using uh, an Uno R3, we are rapidly running out of um, I.O. pins though, so maybe Amiga, uh, on a, an Arduino Amiga is uh, next in our um, investigations. An LCD button shield, um, just the standard design using the, um, again, off of eBay you can see dozens of these things. There is one that I'll mention later on by Adafruit which might be actually better for this particular uh, application. 3D printed cover. Where we're hoping to take this is because at the moment it just has manual control. You've got high and, high and low slew speeds, slew rates so that you can cover the band and um, single stepping so you can you know, fine tune because the bandwidth as I think Lee might have mentioned is very very sharp indeed. Um, and you want to achieve that, um, that precision. In progress, what we're hoping to achieve is to store a table of values of steps from a calibration position to a known operating frequency. So instead of you know, having to 
you know, keep watching your SWR and, and so on moving, moving through the van. You can get within ballpark and then subsequent to that, once we achieve that, uh, we'd like to add in um, some uh, SWR measurement as well and a control loop so that we can actually get in there and, and fine tune the thing. The software design philosophy was to be fail safe. In other words, the limit switches are closed to ground. If, they, if an open circuit uh, occurs, you've got the limit condition and you disable power. Slew rates, as I say, you've got a high slew rate and a low slew rate uh, because of the, um, the criticality of the tuning. In progress, there'll be a calibration feature where we'll step the, um, uh, the system to one end of its range and, defi and define that. And then we'll um, store some uh, values into a, uh, a table. Because we're running out of uh, I.O. pins, as you'll see in a moment, um, controlling, the, controlling an SD card or something, simple, uh, something similar uh, is something that we have yet to address, and maybe that'll be addressed in one of the mini-conferences if I can get along to one tomorrow as well. The design philosophy of the software Fairly standard stuff. I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it in that regards. But you basically you've got constants and definitions, so you don't have to make um, you know, changes throughout your program in a in an ugly way. There's a setup routine in the usual Arduino fashion to set up your uh, parameters, and the main loop then has really nothing much more to do than sense the push buttons, uh, find out what you want to do, activate the stepper in the appropriate directions, uh, and of course keep an eye out for those limit switches. In terms of the Arduino itself, for those who, I presume everybody here knows Arduinos in one shape or form? <coughs> yeah, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Okay, as you'll know, you've got some analog pins and you've got some digital pins. For this particular design, we've reserved analog pin zero for the uh, LCD come button shield. It just uses the voltage divider to sense which button you've pushed, if any. Um, unfortunately, the LCD shield is a bit greedy on digital pins, but mm, therein lies a tale. Analog pin one we're going to reserve for the uh, SWR sensing. Uh, that's a work in progress. And analog pins two through five, because we became rather poor in digital I.O., they've been, re bless you, we've been repurposed as digital outputs to drive the stepper. On the digital side, uh, we've reserved zero and one uh, for serial I.O., not that we're actually using it in this particular context. Um, two and three are the pins that we've chosen to be our uh, limit switch sensors. Uh, four through ten are grabbed by the LCD shield. And this is where possibly if you were revisiting this project you might use the Adafruit design which I understand uses fewer digital pins. In fact I think the Adafruit, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Adafruit uh, interfaces serially. So you know you, you give yourself a bit of a favour there. We're using uh, pin 11 to control the H-bridge um, uh, enable line, because if, of course if you leave power uh, statically on this motor for any length of time, uh, you'll warm up the motor um, unnecessarily. Pin 12 has been reserved at the moment for uh, potentially for SD card control so we can store our table of values. And 13 remains available as just as the onboard LED driver, not that we're using that for anything sensible at the moment either. Where we're going with this is, the, as I mentioned, the stored table of values so that we can uh, work from a known calibration point and get reasonably quickly and automatically to a known defined location. Uh, step will be manually driven to resonance and we'll be able to record the, um, the values and store them in our table. Uh, fine tuning using SWR is something that uh, is uh, on our wish list. Um, as yet, uh, it's, it's a pipe dream, but uh, we think it's achievable. And uh, yeah, some, some nodding of heads indicates that that could be so. Um, I would, I would emphasise that this is something we haven't actually gone out and researched really, perhaps we should have done, uh, what others have done. We've basically brought this up from first principles. I have a sneaky feeling that it probably aligns with similar projects um, that others have done, uh, in which case that's good. We're either all right or we're all, all not. Uh, we'll need an anti-hunting algorithm of some sort so that we're not you know, continuously hunting around for our uh, resonant point. Uh, this slide is probably uh, completely uh, useless given the uh, current context, but for those who are not yet radio amateurs, um, please consider joining the fraternity. 
Uh, you can jump in at a variety of levels. Um, I've, I have the foundation licence which limits me to a range of bands, but it doesn't limit me to experimenting with antennas. Uh, and that's something that um, is a fairly, or, or transmission lines, which is something that's um, a fairly popular topic among amateurs of, of any uh, licence grade. Um, don't be threatened by the fact that you might need to know Morse, Morse code these days, because you don't. Um, so yeah, the rules have been relaxed a bit. Uh, and I th Big pardon? It's handy though. I know I'm learning it. Um, thanks to Ono and um, uh, a group of us who meet uh, of a Saturday morning in something called F Troop for the foundation licensees and uh, you know, returning hams, you know, we're, everybody's welcome. Um, I became aware of something called the Koch method, or Koch method, um, which is uh, one of a number of interesting methods for acquiring. Um, a familiarity with Morse code, and I think I've got a couple of letters so far. I've been a bit slack. Uh, so anyway, um, for those who aren't yet radio amateurs, um, please consider joining the fraternity. And I think on that note, um, can we have any questions, which I may not be able to answer, but hopefully Lee will. Sir? I think we've got an 817 Beg your pardon? Given you've got an 817 Mary Ah, yes. Yes, that could be good too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that could be a nice thought. Thank you for that. Up the back there. This, this particular gadget? Ah. Sorry, the, the question is what, what sort of mountings were used for the, for the loop itself? Ah, in Alan's case, uh, he's using uh, dry hardwood. Yep. Uh, but in some cases, the, the, the loop has been, I think he, he had one out of 20-odd um, millimetre aluminium tubing, which was pretty much freestanding. It was bolted onto the butterfly cap. Uh, there was a, an illustration there earlier, um, which I can't access at the moment, but it's okay. Um, the loops that Lee has been producing are largely of, I think, the freestanding design because of the uh, rigidity of the construction. I the And that's because of the radiation pattern of the loop. Yeah, fair enough. The Japanese design, that oval design, uh, you may have noticed if we sort of get back to it, I'm not sure if we will. Uh, oh, that's okay. Um, but anyway, um, for those who may have seen, it had uh, a couple of additional um, strats, struts in it as well. And the idea there, they were experimenting with um, multi band. So you had an inner loop which was uh, relatively small and an outer loop. Uh, where hopefully the lower frequencies would ignore the, uh, the vertical struts. And part of the reason, believe it or not, for the, uh, the, for the squashed oval shape was so they could fit it in their car. This was a group of, uh, of amateurs who, uh, in, somewhere in Japan who um, uh, wanted to go a little bit portable and they couldn't fit a, you know, the full size thing, so they squashed it. And as Lee has pointed out, uh, that's not a bad thing. It just alters the radiation pattern a little bit. But hmm, you still manage to um, to get the signals out. Yeah. Um, Jim Trudell is speaking about TR. Uh, it's published a bunch of stuff in AR about loops. Mm -hmm. um, and on our local technical net, um, he's been talking about the automated or the, the ATU that he's been building for this using a similar sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, and he's got a Wayne, Wayne Bridge? Wayne Bridge. Wayne Bridge. Okay. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Ah, okay. Right, okay. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Sorry, I, I can't quite. What you've designed here, yeah. in screwdriver terms, there's not, there's not something called a turn count. Mm -hmm. um, and that, it, it, it's a good sort of test frame. Yeah, yeah. And really, that's what we're presenting here. We're presenting basically our, our plain vanilla design, um, capable of all sorts of you know, tweaking and tizzying up, I guess, along the way. Um, and if it's of use to people, and you know, obviously there's a, a bit of interest in magnetic loops generally in the um, in the fraternity, um, you know, if we're able to contribute something, then that's really good, and um, we can certainly learn along the way. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was just interested in what the sensitivity is like compared to a, say, a, a shorter wave or something like that. That I can't answer directly, um, uh, <laughs> Alan or Lee, because I'm. Um, <coughs> And since you're interested in uh, reception, mate. Transmogrify into one of those, I hope. Um, because I also have one of those little SDR type dongles and uh, yeah, and a, a growth area. Um, there was one thing I was thinking of, but it's forgotten, so it's probably about time. Yeah. I, I think I'm encroaching on the time. Thanks very much for, uh, for Lee. This, as I say, was really um, Alan's presentation. I hope that we have done it justice. I'm sure, I know that uh, Lee certainly has from his perspective, and I hope that the Arduino side of things has been, uh, while simplistic, at least a reasonable um, uh, intro to some of the things that you can do with, uh, with these. Uh, I've also used a, an Arduino in a, um, uh, VHF beacon controller, because I'm a member of the WA uh, VHF group, which maintains a range of uh, terrestrial uh, VHF beacons. So we've got a little beacon controller um, going in one of these things. A few other bits and bobs. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your uh, time, and thanks to Lee. <laughs>